please for the delay on to our next topic please welcome dr zakir naik <clears throat> alhamdulillah wassalatu wassalam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmain amma ba'd a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim wa maqru wa maqrallahu wallahu khairul maqrin wa yamkuruna wa yamkuruna wallahu maqrin wa yamkuruna wa yamkurullahu wallahu khairul maqrin rabbi shalli sadri wa yassirli amri wahlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli i welcome all the viewers who are attending the straight path convention as well as the viewers of the peace tv network peace tv english peace tv urdu peace tv bangla and peace tv chinese as well as my facebook and youtube viewers i welcome all the viewers with the same greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may peace mercy and blessings of allah subhanahu wa taala of almighty god be on all of you it is an honor and a pleasure for me to be a part of the straight path convention and the topic of this evening's talk of mine is conspiracies and plots a believer's response this topic was selected by the organizers and allah knows best why they chose me to be the speaker of this topic and they wrote a synopsis of this topic saying that this talk would cover the anti islamic anti muslim conspiracies and plots involving the political up to the socio cultural the economic including the media our day to day life all of us are involved in these conspiracies is it that these conspiracies have come lately or were they even in the past among the muslims and let's analyze what should be a believer's response as per the quran and the authentic hadith this was the synopsis that was given to me by the organizers to speak on it and this topic is apt for today's time but the time is limited in one hour to cover so many things it's next to impossible inshallah i will try and speak a few points on as many points that the organizers suggested that i should speak on and may allah make it easy for me and inshallah i'll try and do whatever justice i can to the topic in the limited time i have got and all of us know that today there are umpteen number of conspiracies and plots as far as muslims and islam is concerned today i'll be restricting my talk to conspiracies and plots against islam and muslims and we find that these plots are there and it is affecting almost all the muslims directly or indirectly whether it be a plot concerning the political scenario the social cultural field whether it be economic field whether it be the media it is entering our homes and we are facing this every day what should be a believer's response were these conspiracies and plots even there earlier in the muslim ummah at the time of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam let's analyze that the first plot or conspiracy against the human being or against the muslim that i know of is the plot and conspiracy of iblis against adam and eve may allah be pleased with them may allah may peace be upon them and when we read the quran 
from the Quran we come to know that the story of Adam and Eve, may peace be upon them, and the story of Iblis is mentioned in no less than eight times in the Quran. It is mentioned in Surah Bakhara, chapter number two, was the 35 and 36. In Surah Araf, chapter number seven, was the 22 to 22. In Surah Araf, chapter number seven, was the 27. It's mentioned in Surah Hijr, chapter number 15, was the 39. In Surah Isra, chapter number 17, was the 61 to 64. It's mentioned in Surah Kahf, chapter number 18, was number 50. It's mentioned in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, was number 120 and 121, as well as in Surah Saad, chapter number 38, was number 82 and 83. This story of Iblis and Adam, may peace be upon him, and Eve, may peace be upon her, is mentioned in the Quran no less than eight times. And most of the Muslim, almost all of us know that after Adam, peace be upon him, the first messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first human being was created, he asked the angels to bow down to him. All bound except Iblis. He was amongst the jinn. And he says that I will not bow. He refuses because he says that the man is made from clay and I'm made from fire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then punishes him. Then Adam, then after that, Iblis requests Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him respite, to delay his punishment. And he will misguide all the human beings except a few. And Allah agrees and gives him respites, delays his punishment and says that you will only be able to disguise the, misguide those who are not my servants. As for my servants, you will not be able to, dis, you will not be able to misguide them. And later on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts Adam and Eve peace be upon them, in Jannah, and tells them, you can eat of all these bounties, but keep away from this tree. And he says that Satan is an avowed enemy to you. Later on, the Satan plans, he plots, he conspires, and he whispers to Adam and Eve, May peace be upon them. And he tells them, do you know why the Lord has told you not to eat from this tree? Because if you eat, you'll become like angels. You will not die. You will have eternal kingdom. And he says, believe me, I am your well-wisher. And Adam and Eve, they believe in the Satan, unfortunately. And after they eat from that tree, they realize the nakedness and the shamefacedness. And they cover with the leaves of the trees the private parts, their nakedness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, Did I not tell you to keep away from the tree? Did I not tell you that the Satan is an avowed enemy to you? And he puts both of them into the earth and says, You live your life, part of it, in the earth. And we know that story. So this was the first plot, the first conspiracy that I know of that was against humankind, against the first messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you read the Quran, there are hundreds of verses which speak about conspiracies and plots, umpteen number. Time will not permit us to discuss them. I will just mention the references of those verses in which particularly the word plot is mentioned and planning is mentioned and Allah mentions this in the Quran in Surah Imran chapter number 3 verse number 54 in Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 123 and 124 in Surah Araf chapter number 7 verse number 99 in Surah Anfal chapter number 8 verse number 30 Allah repeats the message in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 21. In, in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 33. In Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 42. 
in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 46. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 26. In Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 50 and 51. In Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 10, as well as in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 43. In no less than 12 places, Allah uses the word in the Quran as plotting, called a makar, or close to it. And I started my talk by quoting two verses of the girl's Quran. The first one was from Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number 54, where Allah says, Wa makaru wa makar Allahu, wallahu khairul makreen. They, the unbelievers, plotted and planned. Allah too planned. The best of planners is Allah. Allah repeated exactly a similar message. In Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 30, where Allah says, Vayam kuruna, vayam kurullahu, wallahu khairul makreen. They, the unbelievers, plot and plan. Allah too plans. The blessed of planners is Allah. These two words Allah says that Allah is the best of planner. And again Allah says in Surah Raj chapter number 13 verse 42 that Allah is a master planner. And Allah says in Surah Namal chapter number 27 verse number 50 and 51, that they plan and plot, we too plan. If you read the context of these verses, amongst these 14, amongst these 12 verses, these four are more relevant. In brief, I will tell you the context because of shortage of time. In the first verse, in Surah Imran chapter 3, verse number 54, where Allah says, makaru makar Allah wallahu khair makreen, that they planned and plotted. Allah too planned. The best of planners is Allah. If you read the context and if you read the tafsir of Ibn Qasir, it says that the enemies of Isa alayhi salam, they plotted and conspired against him. They go and tell the king that Isa alayhi salam is claiming to be God, he's speaking against you, he's telling the people not to obey you, and the king gets angry and he sends his soldiers to arrest and kill Isa alayhi salam. At the last moment, according to Ibn Qasir, one of the Mufassirin says that someone else, a lookalike, like Isa alayhi salam, was replaced and he was crucified. But what does the Quran say? Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 157, that, they said in both the Jews that we killed Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. They killed him not, neither did they, kill, neither did they crucify him. It was only made to appear so. And all those who differ are full of doubts. With only conjectures to follow. For they surely killed him not. From this verse of the Quran, we come to know that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not killed. He was not crucified. It was only made to appear so. So one of the Mufassirin, according to Ibn Qasir, says that in this place, another person was replaced. And according to the Gospel of Barnabas, it was Judas. One of the disciples who betrayed Jesus, peace be upon him, he was Christmas. Please, we are not going to the details what is right, what is wrong. Allah says he was not killed, he was not crucified. It's sufficient for us. Anyone who differs is full of doubts. But this verse then continues and says, Makaru makarallahu wallahu khair makri. Wa makaru wa makarallahu wallahu khair makri. They planned and plotted. That means the enemies of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. They planned and plotted against him. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planners. And the next verse of Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 158 says, And Allah raised up Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, unto himself. So this is an example that they planned and plotted. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planner. The other verse of Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 30, which says, Vayam kuruna, 
وَيَمْ كُرُونَ وَمْكُرُ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْلُ مَا قْرِينَ They plan and plot. Allah to plans. The best of planners is Allah. If you read the context of this verse, and if you read the tafsir of Mikasir, it speaks about the enemies of the last and final messenger of Allah And it says that the enemies, the unbelievers, the people of Quraysh who did not believe in Prophet Muhammad who did not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who did not believe in, in Islam, they plot and plan against Muhammad One of the people suggests that why not imprison him? But they say if you imprison him, maybe the companions, they will come and free him. The other suggests why don't we exile him? And they say if he is exiled, he's eloquent in speech, He'll convince many people and come back. Then Abu Jahl, may Allah's curse be on him. He says, I have a plan. Let one strong young person from each type of Quraysh, from each tribe of Quraysh, take a pointed weapon and stab and kill Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam all together. So if there are many tribes or rather all the tribes, then Bani Hashim will not be able to fight with all of us. If all are equally responsible for the murder of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then how can they fight all of us? Then we can give them their money, blood money, and the problem will be solved. This was a conspiracy, a plot of Abu Jahl to assassinate Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala reveals this plot to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through asking in Gabriel and commands him to do hijrah. And in his place, Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, who later on became the fourth caliph of Islam, he sleeps in his place, and the Prophet, Alhamdulillah with Allah's help, migrates to Medina. In this context, the verse of Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 30 says, that, do you not remember that they plotted against thee, the unbelievers plotted against thee, to imprison you, or to slay you, or to exile you, they plan and plot. Allah two plans. The best of planner is Allah. This is the context. So there are various such planning and plotting that is mentioned in the Quran. Because of shortage of time, I'll just give you two other references which I mentioned of Surah Raj chapter number 13 verse 42 where it says that Allah is a master planner. It says in context that the previous messengers, many of them planned to exile them, plotted against them. Allah is the one who secures the believers. Anyone who fears Allah, Allah takes care of them. It's also mentioned in Surah Namal chapter number 27, verse number 50 and 51. It is talking about the people of Tamud, how they go against Prophet Saleh, peace be upon him. And they kill the she camel. And then they plan to kill Saleh, peace be upon him and his family. And they say, if we kill him and his family at night, and we will tell the relatives we don't know about it, so no one will blame us. And Prophet Saleh, peace be upon him, he used to go to pray in the rocky track. So they planned that let us kill him there. And then later on we can kill the family and the blame will not come on us. No one will know. So when they follow him in the rocky path, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the plans of the unbeliever. What does Allah do? Allah sends a rock. The moment the unbeliever see this rock coming towards them, to prevent them from being crushed by this rock, they enter a cave and that rock comes and blocks the opening of the cave and they're sealed inside forever. And later on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he destroys all the unbelievers. This is the context of Surah Namal chapter number 27, verse number 50-51. Time will not permit us to go more into details of all the plots. This was just a sample of some of the plots and conspiracies. So what we understand from this, that plots and conspiracies against the believer is from day one. From 
the first human being on the face of the earth. It was against our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve. Peace be upon them. Coming down, almost all the prophets, non believers, plotted and planned against them. They conspired against them. And we have the example of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad. Coming to this day, time will not permit us to talk about all these conspiracies and plots. But as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, that almost all the Muslims, they are directly or indirectly affected or involved by these plots and conspiracies against Islam and Muslims. Whether it be political conspiracies, whether it be economical conspiracies, whether it be social cultural conspiracies, whether it be conspiracies of the media, the entering our homes, and it is entering our lives. What should be a believer's response? We will try, inshallah, in the limited time that we have, to touch upon some of these different types of conspiracies that unbelievers are doing in this present age. Time will not permit to speak about the past. We'll talk about the present age of the last few decades. In the first type of conspiracy is the political conspiracy. And we know that today, the Western world, the biggest enemy is Islam. They are afraid of the spread of Islam because today Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. It is the fastest growing religion in America, in Europe, in the Western world. So much so that there are statistics that in the coming decades, many countries in the world, the Muslims will be a majority. They are afraid of the spread of Islam. They are afraid of the truth. Because Islam is a religion of peace. It's a religion of harmony. It's a religion which says all human beings are equal. It's a religion we speak about human rights, about women's rights, which unfortunately is not agreed upon by the Western world. The Western world speaks about human rights, speaks about women's rights, but all of these are actually not talking and not giving the true rights to the human beings. According to me, the maximum human rights violation that is done in any country, it's in USA. They talk about human rights. They say that they are champions of human rights, of women's rights. But unfortunately, the reality is that the maximum violation of human rights against the blacks, against the non-whites in America, in USA, you can give a talk on that. As far as the political conspiracy is concerned, I'll just give a reference of what happened about a century ago. The main conspiracy was to abolish the Caliphate of Islam, the Khilafat of Islam. And this was done about 100 years back. And the best way they could do is, is to divide and rule. Time will not permit me to go into the history. Many of you may be aware of it, how they did it, how they saw to it that they divided the Muslims. And they were successful with the help of certain unpious Muslims or namesake Muslims in abolishing the Khilafat. And this was done in 1923. And we know that the last, last Caliphate or the last Khilafat the Osmani Khilafat was in Turkey and unfortunately it was abolished in 1923 and but naturally there were some of so-called Muslims who joined hands with the enemies of Islam and they said that we'll abolish it and they gave in writing that for 100 years we will not claim it back and the big empire of Islam 
of Muslims, which was so strong, which people feared, it collapsed. Coming down to the present times, we have today various political conspiracy. The Western world, when they talk about democracy, they see to it that somehow or the other, today the world has 57 countries in which Muslims are in majority. Whether they are 100% or 95% or 90% or 80% or 60%, 57 countries in the world today out of more than 200 countries, 195 registered with the UNO, with the United Nations, but there are more than 200 countries. Out of this, 57 countries have majority Muslims living in it. Whenever the enemies of Islam, when they find out that any Muslim country is following Quran and Sunnah strictly, they see to it that they create a fitna in that country. They create a conspiracy, they, they make a plot, and they see to it that they topple this government. And we know today now, Ummah, all the so-called Muslims are not practicing Muslim. And there are bound to be two types of Muslim, a practicing Muslim and a non-practicing Muslim. So what they do, the enemies of Islam, they support the non-practicing Muslims and they let them come in power. There are many instances that we know in the past few decades in Muslim countries, when there were proper elections, democratically, those party which are following Quran and Sunnah more closely, they won. But what do they do? After they win, within a few months or within a couple of years, there is a coup. I don't have to name the countries in the past couple of decades in which the people who won, they were Islamic. They were close to Quran and Sunnah. But some or the other, these enemies of Islam, they gather together, they support the so-called secular Muslims, the so-called namesake Muslims, and they topple the government. I don't have to take the names of this government. Alhamdulillah, the last attempt that they did a few years back in Turkey, that failed. And Alhamdulillah, Allah's help was there that they were not able to topple the government of Tayyip Erdogan. That's one example where they failed and surely it was Allah's help. So these are political conspiracies done by the enemies of Islam. We will inshallah come to the solution. Before we go to the political solution, I would like to give a few examples of the political situations, the conspiracies and plots that are done by the enemies of Islam against Muslims. Do you know today in the world which Muslims are facing the maximum problems because of these conspiracies? Can you name me which Muslims in the world today because of the political conspiracies? are facing the maximum turmoil, maximum problems, maximum challenges. Can you guess? According to me, the Muslims today that are facing the maximum problems and turmoil and challenges and difficulties are the Uyghur Muslims in China, in Xinjiang, also pronounced as Uyghur. There are two types of pronunciation, Uyghur Muslims, or Uyghur Muslims. And from history we learn that in the mid of the 19th century, when many countries attacked Turkey, many parts of Turkey were taken over, some were by Russia, some part from China, and this Xinjiang area, the Chinese, they took it over from Turkey. That the reason is also called as Turkestan, East Turkestan. So originally it was part of Turkey, the Chinese, they captured it. And you can look by the, by the way they look, the Xinjiang Chinese, you can make the difference. There are two types of Muslims in China. One is the Han Muslims and one is the Xinjiang. The Chinese Muslims, 
known as Uyghur Muslims or Uyghur Muslims. All Muslims are facing problem, but the Han Muslims comparatively are facing less problem as compared to the Uyghur Muslims. Today, according to reports of the non-Muslim organizations, many UN reports and human rights organization, they tell us that the Muslims in Xinjiang, the Chinese Muslims, the Uyghur Muslims, the Uyghur Muslims, many of them are not allowed to offer Salah. They aren't allowed to read the Quran. They aren't allowed to fast. They are forcefully given food during Ramadan. Some of them are also forced to drink alcohol during the month of Ramadan. Not only not to fast, but they are forced to drink alcohol. They are tortured. They are forced to marry the Chinese non-Muslims. They are forced not to learn Arabic as a language. They are forced not to know about the deen, about Islam. So much so that in the last few years, there have been concentration camps that anyone who does not agree with their style of living or anyone who is Islamic, they put them in these concentration camps, which they call as educational camps. So to the world, they are showing as though they want to educate them. But what they're doing is actually torturing them. And there are so many reports of non-Muslim human rights organization that how these Uyghur Muslims, they are tortured, they are not given their rights, they aren't allowed to follow Islam, they aren't allowed to follow the deen, they aren't allowed to follow, they aren't allowed to pray, they aren't allowed to read the Quran, they aren't allowed to fast. Several, many of them have been killed. So much so that today the report says, there are about 2 million Uyghur Muslim in these concentration camps. This is a conspiracy. And we know that the land that the Chinese took over from Turkey, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given, made it rich in minerals. Because of that, they want to see to it that the majority in that area no longer are Muslims. They are migrating non-Muslim Chinese there so that they can have full control of that area. And the sad part of it is that about one and a half years ago, in July 2019, there were 22 countries that wrote a letter to the UN saying that we are against the human rights violation that's happening in China against the Muslim Uyghurs in China. 22 countries, they objected to the violation of the human rights that's happening in China against the Uyghur Muslim. And the sad part of it is that amongst these 22 countries who objected, not a single country was a Muslim country that objected. Imagine out of the 57 majority Muslim countries, 57 countries which have majority population of Muslims, not a single objected to the human rights violation. But 22 non-Muslim countries, most of them European countries, they objected to the violation. Some of the country's leaders, they said that we are very weak, we are not powerful, our objection will not get any benefit, it will cause us more harm, even though this is not correct. But Many a times, you know, the Sharia gives permission that if you are weak and if you cannot, as the Prophet said, the best, if you see an evil, stop with the hand. If you cannot stop with the hand, then stop with the tongue. If you cannot stop with the tongue, then curse in your heart. So maybe these countries who said they could not stop with the hand or with the tongue or could not object or raise an objection, if they have cursed in their heart and remained silent, yet they are Muslims to the lowest level of Muslim. The sad part is that few days later, 37 countries who are members of UNO, they write a letter to the UN saying that China is not violating any human rights. 
what they're doing to the Muslims in the Uyghur is correct. They deserve it. What they're doing is educating them. They are not torturing them. They are not forcing them. They are not taking the rights of Islam against them. Imagine 37 countries. And the sad part of it is 15 of these countries, they were Muslims. Imagine 40% of the countries that supported China, that what they're doing is right against the Muslim, they were Muslim countries. It hurts me. That how can a Muslim country, if you are afraid, if you are scared, the least you can do is keep your mouth shut. And that's what some of the countries did. But imagine 15 countries and all these countries are the main countries. Most of the heads of states, they know me personally. Therefore, I'm not taking the names of these countries. I only pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah give them hidayah. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that if any Muslim is hurt, it is like when any part of the body, the Muslim is like one body. If any part is hurt, all rush to it. We are like one building. We are like one body. We are like one entity. If something happens to one of us, all of us stand by it. This is a conspiracy by China against the Uyghur Muslim so that they have full control of that area. And what are the Muslims doing? Not a single Muslim country is even voicing out anything. We have several such examples. The second example we have is of Myanmar earlier called as Burma. Imagine the lady which got the Nobel Prize for fighting against injustice. She got the Nobel Prize for peace, fighting against the military for the freedom and she gets the freedom. Later on, she collaborates hand in glove with the army and tortures the Muslims, which is a minority, burning the house, killing tens of thousands of Muslims of Myanmar and saying they're not part of the country, taking them out of their home. And how many hundreds of thousands have left the country? Millions have left the country, taking refuge in other countries. Many yet are there. And the torture that is done to the Muslims in Myanmar is unbearable. So according to me, the second worst scenario in the political conspiracy is the conspiracy of the Myanmar government against the Muslims of Myanmar to take them out of the country and take their rights of citizenship. And what are the Muslims doing? Hardly one or two countries spoke about it. Hardly. Are we so weak? The third example we have is of Palestine. Mashallah, as far as Palestine is concerned, the Muslim Ummah was united at least a few years ago. Almost all were united. And we were aware of it, about the torture that happened in Palestine, about the Muslims, how they are living there, the condition, and all of them, most of them have been cornered in the Gaza Strip. We know about it. And we Muslims are united. At least the Arab Muslims, unfortunately now, the relationship with the enemies of Islam, they want to make it better. And they're giving them the legal right. And though the UN is against the atrocity that's happening to the Muslims in Palestine, there are some Muslim countries supporting Israel. It is a shame. All these conspiracies that are happening, what is the Muslim Ummah doing? Like the example of what's happening in Kashmir. What happened last year? In Kashmir, the new BJP government, which is now hardly about six, seven years old, when they came to power the first time, they came with a majority. Second time in 2019, when they won, we came with the greater majority. And we know Kashmir, when 
UK, when the Britishers were ruling India, when they left India, they divided the Muslims into three parts. The policy of the Britishers is to divide and rule. The maximum damage done to the Muslim Ummah in the past few centuries is by the Britishers. They were the main people who abolished the Khilafat. The Britishers were the main people who tortured the Muslim in different parts of the world. Then you have the French, you have the American. The list is wrong. We know in India that, that Britishers ruled many countries in the world. Many countries, including India. They had no right. They said they came for business, but they enslaved the Indians. And finally, when they were forced to leave, they thought to it that they divided the Muslims. In the Indian subcontinents, the majority of the Muslims that lived in any country in the world, it was the Indian subcontinent. One third of the Muslims all over the world, they live in the Indian subcontinent. The Muslims of the Indian subcontinent today will be more than 600 million. Approximately one third of the Muslim Ummah. And when they went, they divided India into three parts. Pakistan, West Pakistan, East Pakistan, now called Bangladesh and India. So one third Muslims approximately remain in India. One third went to Pakistan. One third went to East Pakistan. Then they saw to it that there was a fight between East and West Pakistan. Both became enemies. So now you have three. The Muslims are divided into three parts. Muslims in Pakistan, Muslims in India, Muslims in Bangladesh. They have the policy of divide and rule. And now this new government, the BJP government comes. And when they get more majority, even in the Rajya Sabha and the Lok Sabha both, the lower house of parliament and the upper house, they abolished the 370. Because when there was partition, Kashmir was independent. They did not want to become a part of Pakistan, neither a part of India. They were independent. But later on, they agreed to come as an umbrella. India only as an umbrella, but not part of India. And in the constitution mentioned in Article 370, that Kashmir will have an independent constitution, independent rules and regulation, independent government. Only thing that there will be common, we may be in the foreign policies, maybe, uh, maybe in the defense, and a few things. Otherwise, Kashmir was independent. This government comes and abolishes Article 370. And hardly two or three countries in the UN, three countries, that is Pakistan, Turkey, and Malaysia. The heads of these three countries, they objected in the UN. That's it. Out of the 57 countries, that is hardly about 6%. Less than 6%. And we know that there was a lockdown. And Kashmir was locked down with internet stop. And it was like a big... And, and the Human Rights Organization said it is the largest prison. Much more bigger than Palestine. An amount of, in the last decade, 10,000 Muslim women were raped. Many Muslims were killed just by the Indian army. And what are the Muslims doing? And one of the prayers of the Muslim Kashmiri was that, see, the Indian government, for months you were in lockdown. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put a lockdown in India and all over the world. So that they have a taste of what is lockdown. Imagine the Indian government did a conspiracy they had a lockdown, internet cut, you could not move out. They were imprisoned. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa makar wa makar Allah, wa Allah khair makri. They plan and plotted, Allah to plan. Allah is the best of plan. So Allah put the full world in a lockdown. So at least the people who are in Palestine, they had a taste of it. People in Kashmir, they have a taste of it. Now, the full world, most of the countries have a taste of what lockdown is. And you can see the amount of frustration in the human beings all over the world and the loss of economy and the loss of many things. The list is long. Only taking on political aspect itself, it's long. Time will not permit us to discuss more about it. What is the solution? 
The solution is Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number 103. Hold strongly to the rope of Allah and be not divided. We Muslims should strongly hold to the rope of Allah and be not divided. If we Muslims are united, no one will be able to touch us. No one will be able to play with us. No one will be able to conspire or plot against us. We know from history that when the Muslims were united, when we had the Caliphate, when we had the Caliphate, the Khilafah was there. Even at the weakest time, we were strong. And we know after the four Farashid, after the Umar Malai pleaded with him, he expanded the Islamic empire and the Muslims kept on becoming strong. The weakest was the last Caliphate, Osmani Caliphate. That was toward the start of the 20th century, 1900. And 1520. Even at that time, let me give you an example. Even at that time, when the last Khalifa, Sultan Hamid, he was the last functioning Khalifa. There were two other Khalifa, but they were they didn't have any powers. Even at that time, when they were the weakest, we know that there was a play that was planned to start in France. In France, they were going to play against the Prophet. When the Sultan came to know, he sent a letter to France, to the French government, that we have heard that you are planning a drama, a play, against Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. This is not accepted and will not take it down settingly. Immediately, the French government, knowing the power of Sultan and the unity of the Muslims, he agreed and they not only stopped the play, they exiled everyone a part of the play and many of them went to UK. After a few years, the same play was supposed to be enacted in UK. When Sultan wrote a similar letter to UK, they said, this is not France, we'll continue. Sultan was very angry. He said, you don't know us, my forefathers and the Muslims. We are ready to give our life for the Prophet. And if anything happens after this, you are to be blamed for the consequences. I'll inform all the Muslims in the world what they're going to do. And Alhamdulillah, immediately that play was even cancelled in UK. Imagine in the early part of the 20th century or later part of the 19th century. At that time, when Muslims were so weak, but because we had one caliphate, the strongest country in the world that time was afraid of Muslims. And today, we have the president of France, Macron, putting the caricatures, Nose Billah, of our beloved prophet on government buildings, cartoons, humiliating our prophet, and nobody is opening our mouth. One or two countries are, that's it. Many of the Muslim countries are agreeing this is freedom of speech. What happened to the Muslim Ummah? So number one solution is that we Muslims should be united. United on the basis of Quran and Sunnah. We should not be divided. What's happening today? Unfortunately, today, most of the Muslim countries, most of them, their godfathers are the non-Muslim countries. I don't have to name them. You know it. Most of the Muslim majority countries in the world, the 57 countries, most of them, if you try and find out who is protecting these Muslim countries? So-called protector, therefore I'm using the word Godfather. And they're not Muslims. They are dependent on the non-Muslim for their protection. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 28, let the believers take not for friends or protectors. The unbelievers rather than the believers. If anyone who does that, there will be no help from Allah whatsoever, except in way of guidance. Allah is saying in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 28, that let the believers take not for friends and protectors. The unbelievers, rather than the believers, if anyone who does that, there will be no help whatsoever from Allah.
except for way of guidance. And there are other verses in Surah Maida, etc., which is very clear. Yet we have today that most of the majority of the Muslim countries, their godfathers, inverted commas, are non Muslims. Why? That's the reason it is easy for our enemies of Islam to control the Muslims of the world. Very easy. Very easy to control them. What do they do, as I told you? If something happens, they support the Muslims which are non practicing Muslims. If the practicing Muslims come into power, they do a coup. If it's not a democratic country, they see to it that they take care of the king, of the sheikh, of the Muslim country. And as long as they follow the agenda, they will be on the chair. They are controlling the Muslim world because we aren't united. Why should a Muslim country buy arms and ammunition from a non-Muslim country? There are Muslim countries which are making arms and ammunition. There is Turkey. There is Pakistan. I know they are not number one in the world. Turkey is the ninth most powerful country as far as arms and military is concerned. Pakistan is number 10. Not bad. If we are united, all the Muslims, today, today Muslims are more than 25%, more than 2 billion Muslims in the world today. Out of 7.8 billion Muslims, out of 7.8 billion human beings in the world today, more than 2 billion are Muslims. Percentage-wise, we are more than 25%. Yet some of the heads of state, they say Muslims are 1.6 billion. Where do they get the statistics from? How can a head of a country, which is the second, third largest country in the world, for Muslims, having the maximum number of Muslims, he's telling that Muslims are 1.6 billion. Where does he get the statistics from? He's quoting statistics of 15, 20 years back. According to the PEW report, Pew report, in 2015, more than six years back, Muslims were 1.8 billion. And if you see the percentage of rise of the Muslims, if you calculate that, today in 2021, Muslims are much more than 2 billion in any way. When we are 2 billion, why are you saying 1.6 billion? We are about 26% of the world population. Every fourth human being in the world is a Muslim. Imagine if we are united together, what power will be? What political power will have? Fine, you don't want to come under one umbrella as, as a caliphate, no problem. At least they have good relationships. Why are the Muslims fighting with the Muslim countries? Why? It is the Satan, the Iblis, which is whispering and causing the Muslims to fight. And the Satan is using his disciples, that is unbelievers, the kafir, against the Muslims. And we are fighting amongst ourselves. MashaAllah, good thing that happened in just last month, a couple of months back. MashaAllah, the Muslim countries that are fighting, they came together. I'm very happy about it. A few Muslim countries were against each other and they have got together. I'm very happy about it. Whatever said and done, we should see to it that the Muslims should be united. If we are united, if we are politically stable, we will, inshallah, rule the world. No one will. Imagine, today, the president of France is making a mockery of Islam and no one can say a word to him. Shame. One or two people are speaking. That's it. At the time when we were the weakest in the caliphate, one letter is sufficient to put shivers down the spine. Today, the Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the Muslims wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the wealth. According to me, amongst the top richest Muslim, top 100 richest men in the world, majority, more than 90, 95% will be Muslims. Don't go to the Forbes list. That's only those which own shares. 
Many Muslims are private. The companies are more than $100 billion. I know them personally. Many. Coming to the second scenario. That is the economic scenario. The plots and conspiracies as far as economic status is concerned. And we know today that the world is mainly controlled by a few. The economics of the world is dependent on the banking system. And today's banking system, the riba based system, it is haram. Do you know the Federal Reserve Bank of USA doesn't belong to the federal government. Only the name is federal. The Federal Reserve Bank of USA, which is controlling all the banks in the world, is owned by a few Jewish families. Time will not permit me to speak in detail. The full world economy is controlled by the riba system. Allah says and speaks about riba no less than eight different places. The word riba is mentioned in the Quran. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 278 and 279, if you give up not your demands of riba, take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. Riba is a major sin. If you involved in riba, in interest, Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. According to Imam al dhabi he places riba as the twelfth major sin. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that there are 70 levels of riba. And the lowest level of riba is like doing zina with your mother. It's authentic hadith. The lowest level of riba is like doing zina with your own mother. And today we find the Muslim world. The majority of the Muslim world is also involved in riba. If you stay away from riba, if you stay away from the conventional banking system, you must still become powerful. The full world is controlled by this few Jewish family who own the Federal Reserve Bank. They have the right to increase the interest rate, to decrease the interest rate. They are controlling all the banks. If we Muslims stay away from riba, number one, we will be following Allah's commandment. Number two, Allah and His Rasul will not wage a war against us. Yet the majority of the Muslims are involved in riba. Why? What you should have an alternative is like a dinar, maybe a gold dinar. How the European Union have got together and 27 countries have made a union. Why can't we Muslim have a, have a Muslim union? 57 countries. The European Union are only 400, 450 million. We Muslims are four times stronger, more than four times, two billion. If we Muslim union we have and if you have one common currency imagine what a buying power we'll have 26 percent of the world population muslims two billion the economy everything why don't the muslims get together and have one common currency call it dinar call it real call it what do you want to call it no problem at least unite Number one, stop riba. Number two, have common currency. Number three, stop dealing in dollar. Do you know that if you stop dealing in dollar, if we Muslim leave aside the rest of the world, if the 26% of the world population Muslim says from today, we will not deal in dollar, America will come on its knees within a year. If all the Muslim countries, you know, today, as I told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the black gold, if all the major Muslim countries we deal with oil and natural gas, whether it be Saudi Arabia, whether it be UAE, whether Qatar, Kuwait, Malaysia, Nigeria, you get together and they say we will stop selling petrol, oil in dollar sufficient. And those who tried, they were assassinated. We know Gaddafi. He gave the call that I will not sell Gaddafi, Libya. I know, I don't consider him to be a practicing Muslim. Whatever he was, he said, I will not deal in dollars. They assassinated him. Same thing with Saddam. Why did they attack Saddam? Conspiracy, weapons of mass destruction. Where are the weapons of mass destruction? With the conspiracy theory to attack Iraq. Only to attack Iraq. And 
Mashallah, Dr. Mathir Muhammad of Malaysia, he started uh, Kuala Lumpur War Tribunal in Kuala Lumpur. And many years before, they had a trial, they had international lawyers, five judges, and the judge gave the judgment that if Tony Blair or George Bush set foot in Malaysia, they'll be arrested. Imagine it is someone had the guts. Therefore, I say Malaysia is one of the best countries. It's not politically controlled by the Western countries. Imagine they could not implement the different thing, but they passed a resolution that if Tony Blair or George Bush sets foot in Malaysia, they'll be arrested. And they passed the resolution anyone else wants to sign can sign. Later on, a few years before, a few years after the Kuala Lumpur Tribunal, we have the Chilcot report, I think six, seven years before. From UK, Sir John Chilcot, he said that Tony Blair is responsible and George Bush is responsible for killing hundreds of thousands, millions of people in Iraq. There was no evidence of weapons of mass destruction at all. And Tony Blair knew about it. How did he go to war? And the report is long time will not permit. And he said, even if Tony Blair, UK would have refused not to take part along with US, the relationship would not have been hampered. Imagine USA, UK, along with a couple of other countries, I think it was Australia, some one or, one or two other countries, they attacked the country. And what were the Muslims doing? I'm not a fan of Saddam Hussein. But if you Muslims are united, how dare they touch one of our Muslim brother? What we are doing? We are happy. Okay, this Muslim is having competition with me. So I will see it he goes down. So we are happy that a Muslim brother is being attacked, being killed. What's happening? We Muslims should be one united ummah. We may have differences with our Muslim brothers. We may not like him. But how dare somebody else comes and interferes? And we see that. We know that from the seerah of the Sahabas, that when there was a disagreement between the Sahabas, when there was a disagreement between the Sahabas and the Khalifas, with Hazrat Ali, may Allah uh, have mercy on him, may Allah be peace with him, and, and Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be peace with her, whatever said and then they disagreed. But if someone else came and interfered, they, were, they said, you dare interfere between us. This is a personal matter. We see from the Siras. When the Sahabas differed, they win when they had wars with each other. A third party could not come and interfere, could not support. They would not allow that because this is an internal affair. If we Muslims are united, how dare they come? Imagine, according to that report, they spent $543 million only for making videos, fake videos, to prove that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Conspiracy plotting. Economically, because if we Muslims, coming back to my suggestion, have one, all of us unite, and we trade only amongst ourselves, preferably. We see to it that if we want to invest somewhere, invest in the Muslim countries for science and technology advancement, we'll be on top of the world. You can trade with non-Muslims. I'm, I'm not saying don't do it, but let the union be strong, that we have special consideration for the Muslims. We can trade with non-Muslims, no problem. But number one priority are the Muslims. Imagine if 26% of the world population are together as economically, as trading, as business. How powerful will we be? If we come together, inshallah, no one can touch us. The third, socio-cultural aspect. Social culturally, there are many conspiracies. I'll just speak about one or two. One of the conspiracies that to ban the naqab, the face veil. Yes, there are different opinion in the Muslim Ummah whether covering the face is farad or not, but no one can say it is wrong. A choice. May say it's farad. Some say Mustaf, no problem. Many countries, including France, face veil is banned. Why? Security problem, this risk is there, this problem, that problem. Today, it's the opposite. If you don't go with a face mark, fine. Wa makaroo, wa makarallahu, wallahu khairu makri. 
they planned and plotted. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of plan. Imagine at a time where it was prohibited to wear a face mask, you could be arrested, you could be jailed. In the same country now, many countries in the world, if you don't wear a face mask, don't wear a face mask, fine. Thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, ten thousand riyal, whatever it is. Allah's planning. Where is the security risk gone now? So these are just excuses. If you have to agree, maybe it will be 0.0001%, maybe. But not even 1%. A face mask, a woman wearing a face veil. There's no security threat logically. Is your intelligence so weak? Is it so bad? Excuses. Today in the social, social cultural system, they say that homosexuality is common. A few decades earlier, almost all the countries, homosexuality was a crime. In the last few decades, it has changed. It's no longer a crime. Now, in many Western countries, speaking against homosexuality is a crime. LGBT, lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, LGBT. And now they are forcing, they are forcing many of the European countries, and I know that they force the weak Muslim country, will give you funding if you agree in the law of your country that homosexuality is no longer a crime. And I told that earlier, that when I met the president of Gambia, he told me that the European Union, that was in 2014, the European Union had offered me, offered my country 30 million euros. And I said, no problem. But they put a clause that you'll have to put homosexuality as normal. Homosexuality is no longer a crime. And mashallah, he refused it. So all these strategies they are doing politically, socially, they're trying. So what they're doing? They're trying to change the conspiracy. And now what they're doing, they're making it compulsory. Every school should have sex education. In that sex education, they teach a child of the first grade and second grade. It is common to have two fathers and two mothers. If you have two fathers, it's common. And they are forcing everyone that if you want to join our school, you have to study this. If you are running a school, you have to teach our syllabus. It's happening in UK, it's happening in other Western countries. They are forcing us Muslims to learn what is their view. Though it is condemned in the Bible. Homosexuality is condemned in the Bible. The punishment for homosexuality is thrown into death in the Bible. So these socially and culturally, you find that they are forcing people to follow. And today we find that the way they dress, the obscenity, it is being transported throughout the world, the Western culture. Unfortunately, many of the Muslim countries look up to America and they follow the wrong culture, the wrong practices. It's common. Zina is common. Adultery is common. Fornication is common. Drugs are common. So all the social culture, they're, they're actually a conspiracy. You go to Walt Disney, what's happening in Walt Disney? There they have examples, Tom and Jerry. There they teach how to have girlfriend, boyfriend. There they teach how to have homosexuals common. And we are being enslaved by the views, unfortunately. What should we Muslims do? We should maintain our culture. We should maintain our ethics. We should maintain our faraiz, what mentioned in the Quran and Sahih Hadith. We should not be afraid, unfortunately. Unfortunately, today, we are proud, oh, my son has gone to America for studies. What is the proud to be? We should be proud, okay, my son has gone to the Islamic University of Medina. My son has gone to Islamic University in Riyadh to teach, to learn Arabic, to learn the deen. But unfortunately, most of the Muslims are happy 
gone to Harvard University, have gone to Stanford University, have gone to Oxford University. Coming to the media, time is running short. You can surely, as far as political conspiracies, you can refer to my video cassette. Is there is a Muslim monopoly where I've spoken for about one and a half to two hours, and it talks about various conspiracies, including the conspiracies of 9-11 and the other things, and I've given detail, etc. Coming to the media. Today, in the international media, there is virulent propaganda about Islam. In the international media, they are bombarding misconceptions about Islam, whether it be the newspapers, whether it be the magazines, whether it be the radio broadcast station, whether it be television channels, whether it be the social media, you find that they are bombarding misconceptions about Islam. I've given the talk on media and Islam war of peace. That's another for one and a half hour. If you hear this, you'll find the various types of media spoken about, whether it be the audio media, whether it be the print media, whether it be the video media, whether it be the satellite channels, whether it be the social medias. Today, the most popular, the maximum reach is by the satellite television channels. I know social media is catching up, but yet according to me, satellite media is yet number one. In the next few years, satellite media will be overtaken. But till now, according to me, satellite television channel is yet the maximum reach. And if it's a popular channel, it has a maximum reach. And slowly, the social media is catching up. But the channels are yet lesser in number, maybe about 30,000 satellite channels. In the media, if you go on the internet, there are about 1.7 billion websites only. Then Facebook pages. Then you... 2 billion users of Facebook. Maybe I have more than a billion Facebook pages. Maybe more than a billion YouTube. The list is wrong. So comparatively, according to me, satellite is number one. We have a lot of misconception being spread by the famous satellite channels against Islam. Whether it be the BBC, whether it be National Geography. Let me give you a sample. That once there was practicing Muslim, who came and told me that was Zakir, you know, these Talibans are very bad, ruthless people. I said, why? You know, they beat the women, they do not educate them. I said, who told you? I saw it with my own eyes. Where do you see it? On the BBC. And I'm a person who keep on traveling. Once I met a couple who are medical doctors. And the couple, they told me that the film that is shown on BBC of the Taliban's beating the women, they aren't Taliban's. I said, how do you know? Because we have lived with the Taliban. The way the Taliban tied the turban in that BBC shooting where they show Taliban hitting the women, they cannot be Taliban. Imagine. Now to let you know that we aren't Arabs, but an Arab can recognize that the way uh, Emirati from UAE ties the Qatari the different style, the way a Saudi ties the Qatari the different style, the way a Kuwaiti ties the Qatari the different style. We as non Arabs will not understand, but they know. So, this lady and husband and wife who stayed with Taliban, they could recognize that means the shooting done in Hollywood, that was also not done properly. So, just by looking on the video, you cannot say, I saw with my eyes Taliban the bad people. So that's the reason before accusing any Muslim. Does, don't just go in the media and what the media says agree. May be wrong. Investigate. Just by seeing in the media, you can't agree. I can take your interview and if I ask you, how is George Bush? You will say George Bush is not a good person. I will take that video recording of yours and chop off the knot and change the camera and make it George Bush is a good human being. If I ask how is George Bush, we will say George Bush is not a good human being. I will chop off the knot and join. And in that joint, I will change the camera from mid to close. And it will sound like you are saying George Bush is a good human being. And when I show it to you, 
you will say, oh, sorry, it was a slip of the tongue. It was no slip of the tongue. You said George Bush was not a good human being, but that's called editing. That's called plotting. And you will think you said George Bush is a good human being. This is very easy in the media, just because of seeing in the media, on the video, on the BBC, National Geography, etc., or CNN. Don't make your decisions, please. And that's the reason today, what this media conspiracy is. I mean, and I gave you the example of the weapons of mass destruction, all gimmicks. Today you find that, again, conspiracy, first by the UK government in 2009, that Dr. Zakir Naik said, they wanted to exclude me. Before that, in 2009, in 2009, when I had gone to, gone to UK, I was asked by the head of the counterterrorism department, Charles Farr. He sent one of his assistants who came to me and he said that, Dr. Zakir, you can reach the Muslims of UK. You're very popular. Your channel is very popular. You can reach the Muslims who we cannot reach. Will you help us? So I told him, yes, I will help you under two conditions. Number one, you should not ask me to do anything against Quran and Sunnah. Number two, I don't want your money. Within a few months, the government changed. The Labour Party lost and Conservative came. And Theresa May became the Home Secretary. When, when she came to power, she did not know me. She said, who's the most popular Muslim in UK? And the department said, Dr. Zakir Naik, okay, fine. He should be excluded. But we have no reason. He's coming to give lecture in big stadiums and big halls. Exclude him. But we have no evidence. Try and find something he has said against the UK government. We can't find. Has he broken law of UK? He has not found. Can you frame him? This, this, this is the inside story now. I know the internal because some of the people from the department know me. They even met the CIA to try and frame me in something, but they could not. Their advice was to the Home Secretary, Theresa May, that if you exclude him, he will go to the court and we we'll lose. She said, I will take care of the court. She will take care of the judges. And that's what she did. When they excluded me, I had the best of lawyers. My lawyer said 99.9% .9 will win. One of my fans, he paid for the cost of the lawyers. It's huge. We spent 1 million pounds on the case, total case. But my friend told me 95% will lose. He's a businessman. He knows that even though the lawyers are saying 99.9% .9 will win, according to me, 95% will lose, but we'll give them a tough fight. And we gave them. Initially, we won at the lower court. Then we went to the Court of Appeal. It was our case. Later on, when we went to the higher courts, we lost. Not on merit. What they said, we don't want to go to the merit of the case. The Home Secretary has a right to exclude who she wants. That's it. And one of the statements they took is out of context. When I said that a terrorist is a person who causes terror. For example, if a robber sees a policeman, is terrified. So for the robber, policeman is a terrorist. In this context, every Muslim should be a terrorist to the anti-social element. Whenever a robber sees a Muslim, you should be terrified. Whenever a rapist sees a Muslim, you should be terrified. Whenever any anti-social element sees a Muslim, you should be terrified. But a Muslim should not terrorize a common human being. It is haram in Islam. They pick up my statement out of context and say, Zakir said every Muslim should be a terrorist. The point to be noted, this was one of the statements why they wanted to exclude me from coming to UK. On the 3rd of August 2019, about one and a half years back, one of my Muslim friends from UK sent me an article of Daily Mail. Headlines, the new Home Secretary, her name was Preeti Patel. She says, I want to terrorize the criminals. She's borrowing from my speech. Now, Preeti Patel, the new Home Secretary of UK, she says, I want to terrorize the criminal. When Dr. Zakir Naik says Muslim should terrorize the criminal, he becomes a terrorist. When Preeti Patel, the Home Secretary, says they are praising her, double standards. This is just a conspiracy. They're trying their best to see to it that my work is stopped. 
because very popular, large number of non-Muslims come for my talk. The story is wrong. One more example, same thing in India. I never broke any law of the Indian government. Always I followed whichever country I am. I follow the law of the country. The new Hindu fundamentalist government, which is against the Muslim, they want some issue against me. So they create something and they say, oh, Dr. Zakir Naik is a terrorist. No evidence. They want Interpol to put me on the red corner. They say there's no evidence. Then they change and they say, okay, he's not a terrorist. He's promoting terrorism. Terrorism. No evidence. I have given thousands of lectures. Get me one sentence in any of my lecture in context where I've promoted terrorism. I have gone to the Indian. I have gone to the police academy in India. Massive academy. Spoken to DIGs, director generals, commissioners of police. Not once. Several times. In various countries in the world. I have spoken to Interpol of various countries in the world. What's happening? So, then they say, hate speech. No proof again. So they have gone to Interpol thrice, all three times Interpol rejected. My lawyer says that if a government lays an allegation against a person on terrorism, 99.9% .9 they will issue the red corner notice. But Allah's help was there. Here they did not issue. Maybe because they saw my videos and they, it was very evident. Conspiracy. To stop the work of Dawa in India, I'm, it is allowed by the Indian constitution for any Indian to preach, propagate and practice his religion. That's what I'm doing. I'm not forcing anyone to convert to Islam. But there were hundreds and thousands of non-Muslims and Hindus accepting Islam. Allah is giving them hidayah. So because Allah is giving them hidayah, what they want to do? They want to stop the activity. What happens? They put a fabrication. MashaAllah. I come to Malaysia. And mashallah, my work is increasing. Makaru makarullah, wallahu khairul makri. All the other people say, oh, what difficulties you're facing. According to me, alhamdulillah, Allah transported me. I never had any plans of leaving India. That was my battlefield. With izzat, with honor, Allah transported me from India to Malaysia, a country which I'm loving the most. And I said in my earlier lecture, the question and session, it is the best country to live in for a Muslim today for various reasons. And all these things I'm telling you, Malaysia is safe from many of these things. Mashallah. So that is the reason I chose Malaysia. They tried their level best to use their power against, tell many of the Muslim countries, they spoke against me. Almost all, majority refused. Maybe except one or two of the Muslim countries may have agreed with the plans of God. Makaru makarullah wallahu khairul makri. They planned and plotted Allah to plan. Allah is the best of planner. I've come to Malaysia so many times before. I never thought in my wild days dream that I'm going to settle in Malaysia. Allah's plan. In Putraya, which today I can consider to be one of the best cities for any Muslim in the world to settle in. What a beautiful city it is. MashaAllah. Allah's planning. MashaAllah, we're having we've gone to a different level of Dawa. Dawa is increasing. Coming to the social media back. What we Muslims should do? Have our own satellite. We launched Peace TV. We launched Peace TV in 2006. That's about 15 years ago. And today, mashallah, it is the largest washed religious satellite channel in the world. And then it grew Peace TV English in 2006. Then we launched Peace TV Urdu in 2009. We launched Peace TV Bangla in 2011 and Peace TV Chinese and Mandarin in 2015. And today, mashallah, the whole viewership of the full network is more than 200 million. It's going strong, mashallah. And all our satellite channels are actually high definition. When it comes to social media, we Muslims should take part of social media. We should involve ourselves in social media. The maximum reach today of the social media is the Facebook. Then, then it's the YouTube, mashallah. After they started laying allegations, the Indian government against me, my Facebook followers have increased. And today it is 22.9 million, mashallah. The followers on YouTube alone, 22.9 million, alhamdulillah. It is the largest followers on any page of a religious speaker.
in any religion. There is no other religious speaker in the world, whether Christian, Hindu, Muslim, etc., in English language, which has a follower of, of 22.9 million, mashallah. Has Amin Fazir Our YouTube has increased. First, it was low. Indian government attacked me. More people started watching. Mashallah. So it is a blessing in disguise, I feel. My life has changed. My iman has increased. What should be a believer's response? As I told you, time is short. Time is limited. We finished the four aspects which the organizers told me. Political, socio-economical, uh, social-cultural, economical, and media. What should be a believer's response? In each category, I told you the response. I've given the talk on the 15 point action plan for a Muslim when someone attacks Islam or Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. This was a talk I gave which was for one hour when President Macron attacked the beloved Prophet Muhammad I cannot give one hour lecture. I just briefly mentioned the 15 points. The first I said is whenever a Muslim sees anyone attacking Islam or the Prophet, number one, he should condemn in his heart. Number two, you should condemn on the social media, whichever media has, whether it be Facebook, whether it be Instagram, uh, whether it be Twitter, whether it be YouTube, so on and so forth. Number three, he should distribute as much material as possible, whether physical material, booklet, books, whether on the internet, sending ebooks. Number four, he should inform to the test the 10 most influential people he knows, he should convey the message. Because when a personal message is given, action is taken more. He may know the president, he may know the prime minister, he may know a minister. He may know, he may be a normal man knowing only the chairman in his apartment. Okay, convey to him. Ten most important people, one to one, has an effect. Number five, do publicity, whether it be on billboards, whether it be on buses, whether it be on rickshaws. Publicity number five. Number six is that if a protest is organized, take part in a protest, make it peaceful. Don't make it violent. Number six, if a uh, number seven, if a boycott is going to be useful, like what was done in the Danish cartoons, the Danish project for boycott, number seven boycott can be given. Number eight, contribute whatever you can personally, whatever capacity Allah has given you, contribute money, whatever you can for this cause. Number nine, let it be on the mainstream media. If you have a satellite channel, make it popular there. If you have a mainstream media, whether you have a newspaper, whether you have a magazine, or if you know someone, make it in the mainstream media, number nine. Number 10, let's have an organization, a battery of lawyers, which are expert in handling these cases and make a case in the International Court of Law. <clears throat> number 11, at diplomatic level, make a diplomatic protest. Number 12 is that if required, do a trade boycott. We will not trade with that country. Number 13, if required, cut off diplomatic relationships, like how we did with Israel. Number 14, let there be specialized organization dealing only with such cases who are, if there are any attacks on Islam or the Prophet, they should be specialized in that field. Number 15, the Muslims should unite. And if we unite, I've told you we can be powerful. What should be the Muslim response? Number one, irrespective whether you're, you're involved in that or not. Number one, irrespective whether there is any conspiracy, any plots. First thing is, see to it that you are a good practicing Muslim. See to it they are fulfilling, that you are fulfilling your individual faraiz. Number one, are you praying that, are you on Tawheed or not? Number one, should not do any element of shirk. Number two, see to it that you are for five times salah, minimum, then the other salah. See to it that you're fasting in the month of Ramadan. See that you're giving zakat. See that if Allah has given the capacity to perform much. See to it that you're doing a faraiz, number one. Number two, abstain from the major sins. Number three, abstain from the other sins also. See to it that first individually you are following you, irrespective of whatever the situation of the world is, whatever conspiracy is there, whichever part of the world you're living in, whether you're living in Saudi or Malaysia or India or Pakistan, or USA, you yet have to do your faraiz. That is offering your salah, uh, praying uh, five times a day, fasting in the month of Ramadan, giving your zakat. This should be irrespective of the situation. That is the most important. Number two, as I told you, if Allah has given you the capacity, 
to take part in any way. I've given you the 15 point action plan. Number three, if that conspiracy or, or plot affects you, you should be strong in Iman. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 155, that surely we will test you with something of fear or hunger or with some loss of goods or lives or fruits of your toil. Those people are true, those who are patiently persevere. So here Allah says that Allah is surely going to test you with fear or hunger or with loss of goods or lives or loss of toils of your work. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Anfal chapter number 8, verse number 28, that your position and your progeny, your wealth and your children are a test for you. And there are many verses saying that. Allah says in Surah Al-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 2 and 3, that do you think not be tested? You shall never enter Jannah without being tested. And Allah tested the people in the past. So don't think that you can go to Jannah without being tested. The test is surely going born to come. The test is going to be. So see to it that what you have to do is you have to see to it that you have to follow the faraiz. See to it that you are steadfast in the place. Whenever any difficulty comes, think it is a test for you. Whenever any calamity befalls any human being, it's either a test or a punishment. So when any calamity befalls, first you introspect yourself. That am I doing something haram? Am I disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Am I disobeying the Prophet? Am I going against Quran or the authentic hadith? And you find that, alhamdulillah, you are doing the major faraiz and major thing not. Then you have to consider that this is a test for you. If you are doing any of the harams or any of the things which are prohibited, immediately improve on that. Stop it. Don't do it again. If you find that the major things are fine, then you think this test is, this is a test for you. And higher the test, greater is the reward. So then you have to say, Oh Allah, lay not on us a burden greater than we can bear. Let the bigger the test, higher the reward. So many people tell me, Oh Dr. Zakir, you left your home, what big problem? I said, Alhamdulillah, I am very happy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving me a lot of benefits, mashallah, in this world and in the akhirah. I'm thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want to exchange my position with anyone in the world, not even any president, not any prime minister, not any king, not any, not any sheikh of any country. I am happy with, with I am humble dai, a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abdullah. I call myself a servant of Allah. I am a small dai. I'm happy what Allah has given me. And Alhamdulillah, in these times, your iman should increase. Your closeness to Allah should increase. Your taqwa should increase. So a believer's test is this. That Allah is testing you. And if you pass, Allah gives you this world and the akhira book. But your main aim should be akhira. If you live for this dunya, Allah says in the Quran, Allah will give you dunya, but he will not give you akhira. But if you strive for akhirah, Allah will give you akhirah and the dunya both. So in such times, see to it that you are steadfast with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many times you feel, okay, if I do what will happen, people will arrest me, people will put me behind bars. Please don't change your view. Please don't betray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Please don't go against your deen. Don't go against your Muslim brothers. Be steadfast. These are the times of trials and tribulation. I would like to end my talk with the verse of the Quran which is a good news for all our believers. I would like to end my talk with the verse of the Quran, which Allah says in the Quran, no less than three places. Allah says this in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33, in Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28, and Surah Saf, chapter number 16, verse number 9, huwa allazhi adsala rasuluhu bilhuda wa dinul haq liu zira wa ladine kulli. Allah sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth, so that will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other isms, whether it be Christianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, socialism, communism, atheism. Islam is destined to supersede all, kulli, master them all. And Allah ends by saying that 
وَقَفَا بِاللَّهِ شَيْدًا And enough is Allah the witness. And in two places, Allah says that وَلَوْقَدِ الْمُشْرِكُونَ And however much the mushriks don't like it. However much the unbelievers don't like it. So believe in that. Whatever the thoughts and plans are there, I'd like to end with the same verse which I started. Allah says in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse number 54, مَقَرُوا مَقَرَ اللَّهُ they plan and plot it. Allah to plan. Allah is the best of plan. Barakallahu fikum. Jazakallahu khairan again, Sheikh Dr. Zakir Naik, for your insight on the topic conspiracy and plots, a believer's response. Quite uh, heavy topics, but Allah, inshallah. Um, we'll make do with the amount of time we have left, inshallah, and move on to our first question uh, because we are planning to, inshallah, and before Maghrib begins. So the first question that we have uh, from our participant is that uh, with the many conspiracy theories out there, how do we filter and differentiate between conspiracy theories and the truth using and according to the Sunnah way. The question posed is by amount of number of different conspiracy theories that we have, how do we differentiate between a conspiracy theory and a truth according to Sunnah? Correct, correct, sure. The first guidance we have is in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal. Chapter number 16, verse number 43, as well as Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7, Allah says, Fasalu ahli zikri in If you don't know, ask the person who knows. Now, whenever a conspiracy theory is propounded, it can either be a fact or it can be a fiction. For example, the conspiracy theory was about 9 11, whether 9 11 was actually done by Al-Qaeda, by Osama bin Laden, or was it done by the US government itself? And there were many documentaries and various movies and books written on it. Yes. I'm not talking about it by the Muslims, by non-Muslims itself. And for the full answer, I've given this answer in my lecture, is terrorism a Muslim monopoly in the question answer session? Time will not permit me to give the answer very long. But by the evidence that we, I'll just give one small evidence. For example, they give evidence that when one person from the plane he spoke to his son and said, Mother, I am Mark Benning. I'm Mark Benning. Now the point to be noted when anyone speaks to the mother, will he use the surname? If I speak to my mother, I will say I'm Zakir speaking. I'll not say I'm Zakir Dang speaking. So that means they wanted to identify the passenger so much that in the evidence they gave. They said, I am mother, I am Mark Benning speaking. They should have said, mother, I am Mark speaking. You don't have to tell to the mother your surname. And various evidence that was shown, uh, you can, time will not permit. But when you hear the experts, and when you hear both the sides, Allah has given you a brain. And Allah has given you a thinking capacity. And you can very well analyze that the Twin Tower, a plane crashing, cannot bring the Twin Tower down. And if you see the video, the way it came down, there were explosives put. And there are hundreds of evidences. Time will not let me speak about everything. But point to be noted. Because of that, I said in my talk, it was an inside job. Because of that, Teresa May said, one of the reasons Dr. Zaki Naik should not come to UK was because he's saying 9-11 is a, is a conspiracy theory. Do you know, according to the survey, on the 15th of anniversary, 15th anniversary of 9-11, that is in the year 2016 in France. Now, France is a country which is anti-Islamic. And all of us know that. We know that very well. In France, according to the French, the survey said that 45% 40, of the French don't believe it was done by Al-Qaeda. 28% hmm. of the French people, they believe that this was done by George Bush himself to attack Afghanistan and Iraq. So will UK government now stop 28% of the French people coming to UK? And the answer is no. 
<laughs> if of you course. go to Statistica yeah. website, you go now. I, I just gone to it just maybe, maybe a couple of hours back. In Statistica mm -hmm. website, it says a survey in 2019 said that in USA, 11 people strongly believe in the conspiracy theory. 11 percent, 12 percent believe in the conspiracy theory. 15 percent don't know. 7 percent no comments. Neither strongly believe, neither believe 15 percent. 7 percent don't know. If you add up, it comes to 45 percent. So 45 percent doesn't believe in the government. Amongst the balance, 54 strongly believe that the government is amongst Americans. 45 percent believe the government is strongly correct and 9% weakly believe they are correct. Other statistics they say more than 50% of the Americans don't believe in the government's view that it was done by the Muslims. They believe it's by the inside job. So will they stop 50% of the Americans coming into UK? The answer is no. So in conspiracy theory, we should always be careful that we should see the opinion of the experts. And you as a general person, if you hear you should not convey because you are not an expert. Unless you have done proper research. Unfortunately, many of the Muslims just pick up something and they convey which is totally wrong. For example, you have the conspiracy theory of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Now that is the medical field. Unfortunately, you find so many dies. Oh, this is a conspiracy theory. You should not get in one world. Yeah, what that does, you said this is not conspiracy theory. It is correct. Yeah. I am yeah. a medical doctor. I have read hours and hours of material, yet I don't know what is the truth. Because there are many experts saying that this is conspiracy theory. There are many experts saying it is not It is not a conspiracy theory. So what we have to understand that coronavirus is a mixture. As far as I am concerned, we have to follow what the government says, like the Malaysian government is doing their own research. And you agree with them. Don't just believe what the Western world is saying or what WHO is saying. As far as I'm concerned, I don't believe coronavirus is a conspiracy theory. Neither do I believe it is not a conspiracy theory. There are many things which can be in between, depending upon the research. So today, we cannot keep on promoting any ideas. Even I doing so much research on it, today I cannot say whether it was a genuine need came up as a medical virus or there was conspiracy. There are chances of both. So I'm yet silent on it. As far as Islam is concerned, if you follow the experts, what your country people are saying, your medical directors are saying, follow them. Mm -hmm. Even if they are wrong, yet you will get one shot. Hope that answers the question. Jazakallah khairan again, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Dr. Zakir Naik, for your lecture on the topic and spending uh, some time to clarify the question from our participant. May Allah continue to reward you, Sheikh, abundantly here and in the hereafter. Ameen. Amen. Alhamdulillah, we have reached the end of our second session of the conference. So um, an advice to the participants, if you have any pearls of wisdom that you have gained throughout the session on your social media, please use uh, the hashtag TSP2021, be steadfast. Now for next weekend, our third session will begin uh, Saturday, 27 March, 2021 at 10 a.m. Malaysian time, inshallah, with the topics, the faith and commitment of those who chose and those who didn't by Sheikh Dr. Hassan Akbar from Brooklyn, New York and religion versus culture, where does Islam fit in by Sheikh Asim Al-Hakim. Again, we would like to take this opportunity to thank all paid participants who made it possible for the virtual TSP 2021 to be free for all. Barakallahu fikum. We will also like to take this opportunity to apologize for the delays for, of today's session and any other shortcomings during our live stream in Facebook and YouTube. With that, I hope to see you next week, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh